And here's the reason why today. Paul had just come out of a very difficult moment in his life. It didn't go into the specifics of all that had happened. He told us where it had happened at. In Asia, it was perhaps the most difficult trial Paul had ever faced up until this moment. And I want you to listen today how he describes it. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8. The scripture says this, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble. Anybody ever have any trouble? Of our trouble which came to us in Asia. And this is how he describes it. That we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, when he says above strength, what he means is that it was above his uh, natural strength to be able to carry it by himself. And, and I, I don't know exactly what circumstances he's looking at. It could have been persecution. It, it could have been suffering or threats. We don't really know. And actually, I'm grateful that for that because instead of describing the actual events that he was talking about, what he described were the emotions that went along with the event, all right? And I'm grateful because the truth is my outward circumstances, my trouble probably will never look exactly like Paul's did. But how many of you know the emotions I feel as a result of all of that will look exactly like Paul's, right? And so this is how he felt, burdened, lacking strength, despairing of life. He even goes on in the next verse to say feeling like a death sentence was upon him. And how many of you know that it's easy to give up when you feel that way? It's easy to throw in the towel, to lose heart. And interestingly enough, Paul refers to this scripture, to this trial, this test, this thing he has gone through all the way through 2 Corinthians. And a little bit later in the book, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he gives us really what I believe is the key to being able to make it through. How many of you say, Pastor Bob, I want to make it through? Come on. Whatever you're going through today, whatever you're facing, whatever your circumstances are, the Lord wants you to know that if you'll allow Him to renew you every single day, you can make it through. Come on. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, this is what he says. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. How many of you know you're still winning if you still got heart? Amen? If you're still believing. And he goes on to say, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, and I like the next phrase, is being renewed day by day day. Now Paul is one of the greatest individuals spiritually speaking in the New Testament. I mean he wrote one third of the New Testament. He, he, he boasts about his sufferings for Christ. He evangelized and started churches. He had great revelations where he was caught away into the third heaven with the Lord. And here's the thing. If Paul being such a spiritual individual had to be renewed every day, I know one thing that this guy named Bob, he He's got to be renewed every day as well. Hello? Amen. So we need to be able to trust in Him to renew us every day. And I want to give you this morning four ways that you can be renewed every day. All right? Well, you say, how do we get renewed? First of all, we get renewed by worshiping. Here's how what happens. When we worship, we gain a renewed perspective. All right? Worship renews you. And a lot of people feel like, well, worship is a Sunday morning activity. And how many of you know it is? Amen. How many of you say, I came to worship the Lord today. I came to honor Him, to praise Him. It's wonderful to worship God on Sunday morning, but you don't have to wait till Sunday to worship the Lord. Do I have any everyday worshipers in the house? Come on. Amen. We can worship the Lord because as we worship God, what happens is that God gives us us a new perspective about life. And you see, this is what can happen to us. We get what I call tunnel vision. How many of you know what tunnel vision is, right? Tunnel vision is when you start looking at a problem. And the closer you get to the problem, the bigger the problem appears, right? 
And so pretty soon you're focusing so much on that problem. Your mind is trying to solve the problem. Even your subconscious is going along. You're dreaming about the problem at night. You're thinking about it. You're focusing on it. You're trying to put all of your energy, all of your efforts. What can I do to get through this? What can I do to solve this? And the closer you get, the bigger it seems. Well, let me tell you what worship does. Worship renews you by getting your eyes off of the problem and lifting them up and being able to see the problem solver. Hello? Worship renews you when you stop focusing on the junk of life, the problems, the difficulties, and the heartache, and you start realizing that there is a God that's bigger than our problems. There's a God that's greater than our current situation. Come on, is there anybody that says, sometimes I need to get my eyes off of my current situation, the stuff that's surrounding me, and lift my eyes up to the hills from where my help comes from. Come on. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2 talks of this very thing. It says this, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. When you when you worship, put, set your minds on things above. And when you do that, you get renewed. You get a new perspective. Now let me just give you a biblical example of this. If there was somebody who ever needed to be renewed, it was King David when he came back to Ziklag, all right, with 600 of his soldiers, they'd been out on a raid, and they came back to the little town by the name of Ziklag, where their families stayed, and as they approached the city, they saw the smoke burning, and they realized that their community had been attacked by the Amalekites, and all of David's wives and his children and all of the men's wives and children had been not killed but taken off as slaves. And can you imagine what a disastrous moment that was in his life? 1 Samuel 30 and verse number 4 gives a little bit of the emotion of that moment. It says, Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Wow, can you imagine? I'm sure everybody was upset. These men were thinking, my wives and my children are going to be slaves and concubines. And, and someone even suggested we need to stone David. We need to get rid of him. Look at our leader allowed this to happen. And, and even the scripture says that David himself was greatly distressed. How many of you know if there's anybody that needed renewal at that moment, it was David, right? He needed God to do something. He needed, he needed to have victory. Victory. He didn't feel victory. All he felt was weak with no more power to weep. To weep. You say, well, what was the group's perspective? Here's what their perspective was. It's over, man. There's nothing we can do. They've got our families. They're going to be killing them. They're going to be doing terrible things to them. There's nothing that we can do. But you see, David, the psalmist of Israel, the worshiper heart of David, he understood one thing, that the key to victory was to get together with God. And so let me ask you something this morning. When life's troubles comes, where do you run to? Amen. Do you run to the neighbor? Do you run to your sister or do you run to the Lord? Amen? And, and that I believe that David ran to the Lord. 1 Samuel 30 and verse number 6 is a powerful verse. Just two verses that after we, what we just read, David says, Scripture says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself. I think what David did was he got away and he began to think about God and begin to worship God. Now, he didn't get away and say, oh, thank you, Lord, this is the day that you have made. Yay, 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 my family's been taken captive. No, he did nothing like that. How many of you know that's insanity, right? He didn't do that. But what he did do was he got his eyes off of the problem and he started to focus on the one who was the solution, right? He began to think of the history of Israel. He began to remember that God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He began to remember that God was the one who parted the Red Sea, that God fed them with manna in the wilderness, that He provided a stream of water for them in the desert, that God was all in all. He began to remember the day that when a bear was after the sheep when he was just a boy, and God had 
allowed him to be able to defeat the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. And he began to remember how he had defeated Goliath. And all of a sudden, his perspective changed. Rather than thinking about, wow, they've got my children, they've got our wives, he began to think, I think there's a big God up in heaven. And all of a sudden, David began to feel renewed. Let me tell you something. When you get your eyes off of the problem and onto God, your heart will be renewed. Amen. So, you know, in those days they had to consult before the Lord, inquire of the Lord. And after the Lord said, yes, he's going, if you should go after them, a new, renewed man came to his men. It was not the same David who had been weeping. It was not the same David with a broken heart. No, sir. This was a David whose heart was renewed. His strength was back. Come on. His vision was back. His power was back. His confidence in God was back. And the scripture says that 400 of them, not all 600, 200 of them were too upset. They couldn't get it together. So just 400 of them went and the Bible tells us that they got everything everything and everyone back. Come on. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise today? Amen. What happened? David was renewed from worship. Paul and Silas did the very same thing. Am I right? You remember in the New Testament, there they were. They were down in a prison, having been beaten by the, you know, for the gospel of Christ. Their backs were bloody. Their feet were in stocks. It would have been easy to focus on the dark surroundings of that prison. But instead, they lifted their hearts and they lifted their eyes to the Lord. And they began to sing songs of praise. And it wasn't long before the Lord came and he shook that prison. And the chains came off and they revived. The Bible broke forth and people were getting saved. Come on, somebody. I'm just here today to tell you that when you need to be renewed, you need worship. When stuff is going on around you, listen, don't focus on the stuff. Lift up your eyes to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lift up your heart to the one that can make a difference. Amen. Boy, I feel like preaching today. Amen. Just start worshiping. You say, well, pastor, I can't sing. I couldn't carry a tune if I had it in a bucket. Well, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Get out in your backyard. Your neighbors will think of uh, cows out there having a calf. That's okay. But make a praise to the Lord. Sing glory. Sing praises. And you don't even have to sing. Worship is not about singing as much as it is about magnifying and understanding who your God is. Woo! Amen. Worship. Amen. So the next time something happens at work, what you going to do? Get in that little bathroom there at work. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. God's able. 